there has been some drama surrounding the devs of Disco Elysium. Now, Disco Elysium itself is a game that I freaking Today, gonna... love. Um, look at this, this old video from March of 22. So like a year and a half ago, basically. Uh, in the old studio, all the white lights. Ooh, I was, I was trying to go crispy with this set. I don't know. This is a throwback, but basically this video breaks it down why I love it so much, but the game is sort of a top-down isometric, uh, narrative RPG. It's very dialogue heavy. So if you don't like, you know, a lot of reading and, and dialogue, you're not going to like the game just straight up being honest. But if you do, it is one of the most well put together in terms of ambiance, in terms of world building, in terms of written dialogue in terms of consequence within the narratives, different approaches being an RPG. There's just so many amazing things about it. It is awesome. With this though, everybody praised it. It won all sorts of awards. It made millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then some news started to trickle out that there was potentially some drama, some scandals brewing within the game. And People weren't really clear on what it was that was going on, but it was then announced that the developers left the studio, like the, the main writers and stuff, they had, had gone away and nobody really knew why. They're like, wait, they just, they founded a studio, had an amazingly successful game, and now they're leaving it? How does that make any sense? And so it just kept going, kept going. More information came out. And then there were allegations of toxic behavior. And then other people say... Um, that the IP was stolen by the CEO of the publishing company. And it just got really, really chaotic really, really quickly. Now, the definitive take and breakdown of this, in my opinion, don't worry, it's not my own video. Don't worry, I'm not about to do that, <laughs> is a documentary from People Make Games. This thing is two and a half hours long, okay? I, as much as I love long form content and stuff, I don't think it's reasonable for us to, to like break that down, um, it, it, like in its entirety. What I think we're going to do is we're just going to go through their story recap of the first seven, eight minutes describing basically what's happening. And then we'll offer thoughts and, and break it down beyond that. But all of this is very, very complicated. Just to be very clear, there are debates as to who owns the IP. There are debates as to whether the developers should have been fired or if it was just a quick kind of scapegoat situation where they're like, we want to own the IP just for us. And so we're going to make up stuff that these guys were terrible people and we're going to fire them because of that, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're going to break it all down, okay? I, I think it's a very valid concern. There's a lot of very valid things being brought up here. And there's also a lot of stuff that I think is the potential for just drama. So we're going to try to sift through all of that. Okay. It's going to get, it's going to get messy. Um, real quick. Thank you. D Peterson for the sub with prime. Also shout out to Ali XX 23. Thank you also for subbing with prime over on Twitch. Much love my friend. Let's see what we are dealing with here and what's going on with Disco Elysium. Tallinn in Estonia to find out what on earth has been happening with Disco Elysium. I'm sorry to already start it. One of my dreams, I think that would be really, really cool, is if we could start doing big documentaries like this, where we actually like, hey, we want to know what's going on with Zaum and Disco Elysium. Let's fly to Estonia and figure out what's going on. Like, I think that would be so, so cool. Personally, um, maybe viewers wouldn't care that much, but maybe that's what we start like a Patreon fund for is for developing some of these, like some of these projects and stuff. Maybe that's what we do. Cause people are asking, would you start a Patreon to work on big projects? Maybe that's what we do. We start a Patreon for big documentary stuff. That'd be cool. Um, also shout out to Solrock PT for something with prime. Thank you, my friend. In about an hour's time, I'll be heading into that building just behind me over there to sit in a courtroom and watch Robert Kurvitz, the game's lead writer, sue the very company he helped found in this city after since being ousted by the other shareholders. This story is 
messy. Disco Elysium, for those that don't know it, absolutely startled the games industry when it released in 2019. This booze-soaked avant-garde wonder that would go on to sell millions of copies, win a bucket load of awards, inspire a globe-spanning fandom, and even its own line of clothing. And yet, not long after the developers performed a well-deserved victory lap in the form of Disco Elysium, the final cut, everything seemed to come crashing down around them. The accusations surrounding this game's studio are, in a word, enormous, with its future, and indeed the future of Disco Elysium, very much at risk. And because of that, because the stakes are so high, we've thrown absolutely everything we can at our reporting in order to make sense of it all. We'll take you with us to four different cities in three different countries across two separate continents, as for a start, we confront Zaum's CEO over accusations that he's stolen Elysium from those who first dreamed it into existence. That's an interview with some difficult questions in it, especially when it comes to the topic of a hidden business partner previously convicted of major investment fraud. Now, some of you will have heard bits like this gets deep and dirty. So again, the documentary is phenomenal. I, I recommend everybody watch the documentary if you're interested in this at all, because there is there's so many layers where there's somebody previously convicted of fraud that owns this part of this company and they're involved. So they think, well, he's committed fraud before, so maybe he's going to to commit it here and stuff like there's just so many little moving pieces. It gets really really crazy spec ops just gifted five memberships on youtube by the way shout out to spec ops thank you my friend good to see you around here too stefan my understanding is that the ip has a lot of potential for peripheral media like movies and such so it is plausible that outsiders had a great interest to own it messy situation well and that's the thing so there is a difference between legally taking an ip away from somebody through legal processes and illegally doing it through fraud. There's a difference. And I, I think the the question right now is a legal question within these Estonian courts. Shocker, I don't really know Estonian law. <laughs> it's not an area of, of specialty for me. Um, I have a lot of family members who are lawyers in the States. So I have a general idea of how most legal systems work in broad strokes and a much better idea here in the States specifically. But Estonian law is different than all of these other laws. I mean, even in the U.S., most corporations will found themselves out of Delaware, whether you're Apple, whether you're you're uh, like Trump University, whatever you are, you're going to go and found yourself out of Delaware because Delaware has case law that's really favorable for corporations. So everybody founds themselves in Delaware, even if they're based somewhere else. There's all these like little details where depending on where you are, the laws would be more favorable to a company versus individuals and vice versa. So in the case of a company founded in Estonia, I don't know the individual details of it. However, what seems to be going on is that for one, the IP has been taken from the person that wrote it and kind of created it. That seems pretty clearly to have happened, which sucks. You know, it, it's a bummer, of course, for that person. The question is whether that was valid. And that seems to be a real question. Um, ISA, thank you also for five community subs on twitch my goodness is it what i'm wearing again why why are you guys being so generous the the company is saying that he was ousted the guy that created it was ousted because he was like extremely toxic he was extremely sexist he made it impossible to work with him he was just a, a kind of nasty guy and especially once the game came out became super successful he became a total nightmare like they say there's very valid reasons to have kicked him out and so it would be like if and this is just an analogy. I'm not saying this is the case. It would be like if Hideo Kojima all of a sudden was like kicked out and Sony owned the rights to to um, Death Stranding. And he's like, this is ridiculous. I created Death Stranding. I should own the rights to it. I should be able to make the games. I should do this. I should be involved. And Sony's like, well, Kojima, we caught you eating um, like raw fish on your desk and then you also had a collection of hamsters that you would use and spread out like peanut butter on toast and then eat them. And you'd pop little mice like sardines and it made everyone really uncomfortable. And so we just don't think we should work together anymore. Like whether you agree with it or not, they seemingly had valid reason to let him go. And so he was separated from the company and things changed. Um, well, it kind of happened with Konami. I guess, yeah, I could have... <laughs> <laughs> Instead of making up an insane 
eating hamsters like sardines example i could have said the thing that actually happened yeah that does make more sense um kinematsky i guess that uh I guess, that, I guess that does make more sense. But yeah, I, I mean, Metal Gear Solid, that is a, a perfect example. Um, yeah, everybody's like, uh, Luke, dumbass. No need for a hypothetical. It happened with him in Metal Gear. Yeah, it's a great example. It happened with him and Metal Gear precisely, where he goes to Konami, builds this amazing franchise, and then he's fired seemingly for valid legal reasons and then as a result he loses access to the franchise he helped create it sucks and fans of course aren't going to like it and in the case of kojima it doesn't seem like there was any uh, allegations of like actual serious misconduct it just seems like they were saying he was really hard to work with which i let's be honest i totally believe that kojima was very hard to work with but Whatever the cause may have been, um, he was let go and that changed the history of Metal Gear. And in this case, it's not just that these guys are hard to work with. They're alleging, the company is alleging that the developers and the creators involved with this that have been booted out are actual, like they're actually committing misconduct. It's actually a toxic workplace. They're, they're treating employees poorly and that's why they were fired. So, you know, it, it just, it's hard to believe, uh, hard to tell who to believe. Because I think there's arguments for both sides that both sides have a vested interest in maybe stretching the truth a little bit. The company that now owns it, of course, they want to make the previous founders and owners look really bad because they will then retain ownership of it. But then the people who were booted out now really want to make the corporate guys look like they're just stealing it and they're arguing in bad faith because then they can retain ownership of it. So you just never know who to believe. And it could be that there's a little bit of truth here, a little bit of truth there. They're both sort of telling half truths. And the answer usually in this stuff is somewhere in the middle. It's usually not as simple as just, yeah, these people are just making up everything and stealing everything from them. This isn't Tiger King. Okay. It's not Tiger King this already and for those who haven't we'll catch you up as well don't worry but in short there's a compelling narrative here that the original creators of disco elysium may have had both their studio and their life's work pulled out from under them by crooked businessmen hungry for profit that's an infuriating prospect and it's led many within the games community to feel it's now their responsibility to fight back against the forces of capitalism on behalf of Kurvitz and the others who've been fired we saw this most recently in the very negative response to a recent disco patch which introduced a new collage mode to the game, for example. But is it all as straightforward as that? Because here's a complication we'll also need to explore. I've now spoken to 16 Zaum employees, past and present, some of whom have been there since the very beginning and whose contributions to Disco Elysium have been immense and a significant number of them have described Kurvitz in particular as having been a damaging presence within the studio, who was fired not because of some great conspiracy among Zaum's other shareholders, but because his behavior left the company no other choice. It's our job to talk about that as well. And First of all, a little bit of skill in the leads. Um, oh, so this is a message to Robert Kurvitz. Please be I'm very happy to discuss these things with you. First of all, a little bit of Disco Elysium. Uh, it was a Disco Elysium leads meeting, and you are not the lead of any Disco Elysium project. Also, that Patrick was leading it, and you had zero respect for the structure. I had to come in and defend it. You're very important for us to start doing Disco Elysium 2, hence the acceptance of your long vacation. And we will only do Disco Elysium 2 if you want to. We know now that it's not possible to raise money through the industry for a company that operates like the Zoom from the Merve time, maybe, I don't know. Uh, together, we will have to try to build a company that not only looks, but also is professional, but that's not what yesterday's lead meeting was. It was back to the Merve chaos main points in case we don't find a chance to discuss before my holiday. You're certainly very good, uh, a very good Elysium writer, but you're also a rather difficult person to work with. Cash is the lead on epic skills, and you can only work on it if Cash wants you to write something. And you have to follow his orders just like any other writer. The way you ignored him at the meeting yesterday is unfortunate bully behavior. The same kind of bully behavior that you've been in for a year not communicating with him. People notice things like that, and we with Kaur and Ilmar have promised that we will never tolerate or allow that kind of behavior in the company, not by any person, whether he is a shareholder or not. So it just sounds like from this allegation from Dennis Havel, it sounds like he's just Robert Kurvitz is, is perhaps just very difficult to work with. And eventually they got fed up with it, booted him. And now he's crying foul when it, it like, it seems like they gave him many chances 
at least in this email thread, it implies that they're giving him many chances to fix it and rectify it. Eventually, take those allegations to Robert Kovitz and the- <laughs> Weren't the company founders avowed communists? Isn't this just returning the means of production to the workers? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, kind of. The others who've been fired- This is Kovitz. Him. Now, I know it's tempting to try and understand this story purely in terms of heroes and villains. Of course it is. But from my perspective, at least, there's maybe more to it than just that, which is perhaps fitting given that we're talking about Disco Elysium after all, whose characters are layered and almost always flawed and rarely just one immovable thing. So let's begin with the accusations that have already been made publicly Cap. by both sides. That's a good starting point before we then head into court. In October of 2022, Martin Leuger, a longtime friend of Robert Kurvitz and a former Zaum employee, published this post on Medium with the title, The Dissolution of the Zaum Cultural Association. We'll get into what that's referring to later on in the video, but for now, here's the handful of words that would lead to things escalating very, very quickly. While referring to Zaum, as in the company, Martin writes, I would note that neither Kurvitz, Hindpair, nor Rostov are working there since the end of last year, and they're leaving the company was involuntary. That's referring to Robert Kurvitz, the lead writer and lead designer for Disco Elysium and a shareholder in Zaum, Alexander Rostov, the game's art director and again, one of the company's shareholders, and Helen Hindpair, who was not a shareholder but was a writer on Disco Elysium and then became lead writer on an expanded version of the game called Disco Elysium The Final Cut. These three leaving Zaum came as a huge shock to Disco fans who'd assumed they were busy working away on the game's sequel. But that word, involuntary, it suggested even bigger problems. Yeah, and when you hear this, I think we all immediately go, especially when you just play Disco Elysium and it's all about like, you know, power dynamics. It's about the people versus uh, the powers of be and, and, you know, corporations overstepping. Like it's thematically very in line with what you would expect for Hogwarts or for Hogwarts, for uh, Disco Elysium. And so when you hear this, you think, Oh, so they were pushed out and like robbed of their their studio, robbed of the IP, and it's not their fault. Because we never want to assume that people we like the work of could be responsible. Miney's having a good time. Could be responsible for maybe some poor behavior. But in some cases, it it can be the case that somebody you might have liked turns out to be kind of a dick. Um, you know, it can be kind of surprising when you hear that, but it's like when you see those videos of Harrison Ford acting horrible to fans and you're like, oh, but I like, I liked him and I like Han Solo and I like Indiana Jones. Why is he being such a prick? And he's just like nasty to people. And it turns out, well, I mean, he's just, he's not the characters he plays. Shocker, right? He, he can be kind of a nasty guy sometimes. It happens. Had the three of them been fired? Confirmation eventually came via Kurvitz and Rostov, who released a joint statement claiming that Zaum's CEO, Ilmar Kompas, had illegally snatched control of the company by using Zaum's own money, somehow to buy out another shareholder unbeknownst to them. He may well end up in prison for doing so, they point out. Okay, so they say that they used, he allegedly used money within the company to buy out another owner. I, I would assume that thus giving him personally, not the company, but him personally, the majority of shares outstanding. And therefore then he was in control of the company and then could kick them out, even though they were minority shareholders. Um, he could then kick them out probably because of the, the initial formation agreement and therefore you know, he owns the company now, but they're arguing that he did it with money that wasn't his. This is mostly like, this sounds like it's just going to come down to little bitty details in the, the paperwork of like the founding agreements and stuff. I've founded a handful of companies in my time. And in all of those, those formation documents and stuff, you'll have outlined, okay, this is how we distribute funds from the company to the owners. We do it quarterly, we uh, like the decision for how much money is removed and distributed is made by the majority of shareholders. Um, it's voted on blah, blah, blah. And you break it down. If no agreement is meant, then you keep negotiating. Otherwise, no money is pulled. Like all of these things are spelled out very precisely in these operating agreements and foundation documents. So I would assume it works the same in Estonia because I don't know why it wouldn't. So I would guess that this is something that could be resolved relatively quickly in court. Um, and by relatively quickly, I mean in court, nothing's fast. So it's probably still going to take a year or two. But I, this all sounds like something where there's clear answers written in the documents. And it's just going to be a matter of 
getting that information in front of the judge. Here's a direct quote from their post. Our firing came weeks after we started asking for documents and financial data, which is still being kept from us. Zaum released its own official statement to the press, accusing Kurvitz and Rostov of lying about what happened and listing its own reasons for their firings. And they also outline limited to no engagement in their responsibilities and work, including not working at all for almost two years while still being paid by the studio and forcing colleagues to compensate for their lack of effort. That's true. That's that's rough. I mean, it does make sense. You released one of the most popular games of the year. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're like a mini celebrity and you made a bunch of money. You're like, wow, I'm I'm all that in a bag of chips. And they apparently just stopped working, allegedly, according to the company. Um, creating a toxic work environment that is antithetical to the Zaum culture and team productivity, misconduct in interacting with other colleagues that includes verbal abuse and gender discrimination, and attempts to illegally sell to other gaming companies Zaum's intellectual property with the aim of undermining the rest of the team. So they're alleging that they were potentially taking like Disco Elysium to other companies to see about doing a sequel which I think is something they describe later in the documentary is that Kurvitz and those guys were trying to go to other studios and publishers and stuff to do a sequel when they didn't own the rights to it. Zaum owns the rights to the game, to the, the IP. And like the, the risky thing with this is that their, their complaints and everything might be very, very valid. Um, and their frustrations are certainly very, very real, but there's, there's like another question of whether like you don't have to like the reality that's presented before you. You don't have to like that the company owns the IP and that now you don't own the company or the majority of the company anymore. So therefore you don't own the IP. Like it sucks. Yeah. But that's what happens when you sell the IP or the IP is created within a company structure that owns the IP. Like this is just how it works. I know it sucks because of course they would like to still own it. It's their baby. They worked very, very hard on it, but this, type of thing just can happen and unfortunately it seems like like this again this is why it gets so messy because somebody somebody's lying or at least both people are partially lying you know there's there's no situation where everything that's being alleged is true by both sides at the same time it seems like uh, and if you watch the whole documentary it does seem like there is a decent amount of evidence suggesting that these allegations are mostly true, if not completely true. The question is, okay, well then does that justify these people being fired and removed from the company? And that's something where you can kind of decide for yourself. What I will tell you is if I was running a company and a business and I had an employee, no matter how skilled and talented they were, if they were trying to sell to other gaming companies our intellectual property, if they were engaging in gender discrimination and verbal abuse, if they were creating a toxic work environment and treating people poorly, and if they were not working for almost two years, I would fire them so quickly, <laughs> like zero doubt. And they're able to say pretty confidently through these interviews and stuff that that was probably all true, that they, they were not exactly the hardest uh, workers. The work environment was pretty toxic. As you can see, like they have interviews with a lot of other devs who um, are able to back up a lot of these ideas that Robert Kurvitz was pretty tough to work with and pretty nasty at times. And then they interview Robert and Rostov and Helen and everything, and they offer their side of the story. But the main takeaway is that it's just extremely, extremely messy. As this one, Rev says, two things can be true at once. Robert can be a creative genius that is a bully and a terrible boss to work under. And two, Ilmar, which is the, um, it's this guy, the CEO of Zaum that they're saying stole everything away. Two, Ilmar, uh, along with other shareholders, stole the company from right under Robert and Rostov's, nose, Rostov's noses and are using these claims of bullying to make their firing look less suspicious. I mean, yeah, it's it depends on what you mean by stole the company. Like it's for them, they could look at it and be like, yeah, we can fire him and then get access to the whole IP and we'll own it ourselves. But also, why would they want to get rid of like the most valuable members of their team? You know, like after the game has already launched and most of the sales have come in. Like this is the kind of thing that Ubisoft was accused of doing the opposite of. Ubisoft allegedly had a lot of talented designers that they really liked that were engaging in toxic behavior, discrimination. They were just nasty people. It's the same thing at Activision Blizzard and everything. We've heard it all 
many times before, and they intentionally did not fire them <laughs> because they didn't want to give up the talent, right? They wanted to keep those people on the teams. So they kind of buried it. They kind of covered it up, allegedly. And in the case of Zaum, it seems like there was this toxic behavior and stuff, and they actually fired them. And now it's totally blown up in, in their face, of course. They're, they, yeah, I guess, own the IP. But no, now the fan base is super pissed. Now everybody's like, should I even buy the game now? Because money's going to go to these guys that stole it away. Like this, it, like either way, it seems like there was not a clear answer that would have made everybody happy or been a win-win for everybody. You fire the toxic people and then people accuse you of stealing the company away. And then you also, like if you don't fire him, then you're accused of harboring uh, a, a guy that's engaging in gender discrimination is super toxic, refuses to work. So there, there's just a bad spot to be. So, and that's why I'm saying like if, both of these things are true, which I don't think everything that both sides are saying can be true at the same time. But if these two bullet points are true, that he's a creative genius that's a prick and is, is a bad worker, employee, and really toxic as a manager. If that's true, and it's true that they saw this app as an opportunity to take the IP away, like everybody loses. <laughs> you know, nobody won. The company doesn't win because now their IP is worth way less than it was before they fired everybody. And of course the guys that were fired now have to go away. I, I think there's other debates right now with like non-compete clauses in their contracts and stuff, which they're negotiating in court to see if they can get away and go do something, um, make another game or something. But it's just, the whole thing is really, really messy. Yeah, as long as they sort out the non-competes, I could see Robert Kravitz going, signing a deal with another publisher and getting money. He's like, yeah, I made Disco Elysium. You're going to give me millions of dollars and I'm going to make another extremely successful video game franchise. Just give me money and time and a team. And he'd probably be able to do it. But then again, a lot of those other publishers are going to look at this stuff, these allegations and be like, okay, well, I mean, do we really want to associate with you now? Yeah. It's just the whole thing is so, so messy out of absolute nowhere. We're at a, a situation with this particular topic where there is no clear answer. There's a lot of allegations being thrown around and nobody really knows precisely what the truth is. What everybody seems, except for, I don't know if Robert Kravitz would agree that he's toxic and is, is not a good coworker and stuff, but what everybody other than Robert seems to agree on is that he's not great to work with. He's pretty toxic. And he was a great writer that actively harmed the development of the game. Everybody seems to agree on that. And then everybody else seems to say that the CEO of Zaum saw this as an opportunity with his toxic behavior. They saw this as an opportunity to go in and take the company over. And whether that was a smart choice or a bad choice, who can say? It seems to me like if he was damned if he did, damned if he didn't. If he took the company away and fired Robert Kravitz, this situation happens and the IP has lost value. And now he's fighting a legal battle and it's, it's all just a mess. And then if he didn't kick him to the curb, he'd be accused of harboring like a toxic guy and, and making a toxic workplace and everything. So there's just no great solution. Everything, everything's bad. Everything sucks <laughs> at the end of the day. Everything sucks. Everything's bad. So I guess to answer the question that started this whole segment, should you buy Disco Elysium right now? Honestly, I don't know. Honestly, I have no idea. It's, it's still a mess. So if you're uncomfortable with it, I would say just like buy a second hand copy or buy it off of like G2A or something where the copy already has been purchased and exists. So they aren't getting any more money. They're just, you know, the key is being transferred basically. Um, that would be my suggestion. The game itself is amazing. And I think the game itself can be enjoyed. Um, like many pieces of art, I think you can enjoy the artwork independent of the artist. So I'm not too concerned personally um, with that. But that's just something for you to answer for yourself, of course. Just because I'm comfortable with it doesn't mean that you will be uh, comfortable with it. And that's totally fine. <music>